Welcome, I'm the Word Nerd, and in this video we're going to continue our Hosea study, and we're going to jump into chapter 6. I hope this is inspiring and encouraging to dig deeper into God's Word. So, we have completed the other chapters, and also the background information of Hosea. So, Hosea is a special book to me, and that's why we have studied this chapter, or this book, um, so check out the other videos in the series to look at the other things. So chapter six is 11 verses. And as always, we're going to just read a verse and kind of look at my notes and go from there. Verse one, come, let us return unto the Lord for he hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. So normally the first thing I always look for is words that I want to do a word study on. So the first one is return. Return means to bring, send, or put back to a formal or proper place. So let us return unto the Lord. Now, if you don't know how I do this, check out my other how-to videos on how to verse map and how to study the Bible. It will explain all that I have going on here. So come let us return to a proper or former place, right? So in the chapters before, basically Israel and Judah, both of the kingdoms, have rebelled against God. And as in like a, what is, what's the word I'm looking for? So basically they have committed whoredom against God, which means that they are going after other gods and they have sinned and they're doing evil things. Um, so this is the beginning of chapter six unto the Lord. So let us return unto the Lord for he hath torn. So hath torn is, I did a word study and it's, um, not a complete word study, but I was looking for some reason, the tense of the verb. And this is actually in the perfect tense, which generally designates a completed action or a situation that is viewed as a single event. So he hath torn um so this is hosea is doing like when they are going to be in the they're going to be take captive israel as a nation is going to be taken captive by another nation um so he hath torn and then he will heal us he will heal us is one word and it is in the imperfect tense, which generally designates an action which is continuous, incomplete, or open-ended. Rather than depicting an action, a single event, it depicts it as a continuous process. So, he will heal us, though it's going to be a continuous process of healing. He has smitten and he has, he will bind us up. So, smitten is another word that I did. This is also in the imperfect tense, but I also got the definition, which is to strike sharply or heavily, to kill or severely injure by smitting, like slapping, to take or afflict suddenly and injuriously. So, uh, God did and is judging Israel for the wrong that they have done, and he will bind us up. So bind us up is also in the imperfect tense. Secure by tying to wrap around with something so as to enclose or cover bandage. So he did judge them, but he is going to also bind us up. So there's parallels. Half torn, smitten, he will heal us and he will bind us up. Now remember, these are in the imperfect tense. Um, so it's a continuous process, um, not a singular event. Verse 2, oh wait, and then I did, I underlined it in brown, and I did some cross-references from chapter 5 and into chapter 6. It seems that this call to repentance shows they are not truly repenting as they try to just motivate it by self-preservation with sacrifices, but not a repentive heart and want to truly know God. The book makes it clear it is past the time for repentance, that judgment will and be their consequence. Um, so in chapter 5, verse 6, 
we go back here. They shall go with their flocks and with their herds to seek the Lord, but they shall not find him. He hath withdrawn himself from them. So they're going to sacrifice, which is what the flocks and herds are. And if we jump ahead to um, verse it says 6. For I desire mercy and not sacrifice in the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. So it seems like they're saying let us go back and things, but... Um, in a sense, they're already kind of past that. They are going to be judged. Um, God gave them time to repent, and they have not. Okay, verse 2. After two days, will we revive us? And the third day, he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. So I just underlined it, just meaning that I'm going to kind of talk about it. So this is my note for verse 2 my first thoughts was on jesus that he rose on the third day and i gave some cross references however the wording does not suggest that hosea was writing about christ but there were definitely seems to be a connection to christ if you think as his people as his body like we do in the new covenant some see this as a prophetic mystery about the nation of israel and jesus second coming and his thousand years reign um, as refer referencing. Still others relate these words to a future time in which Israel will return to God. We will live in his sight makes me think of eternity with him. So I read um, my, so you kind of get my thoughts on it, but I also mention the other thoughts of other studiers and scholars and stuff like that. Verse 3. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. His going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. So I did do a word study on follow, and it's over here. And follow means to engage in as a calling or way of life, pursue, to accept as authority, obey to seek to attain to copy after imitate to watch steadily to keep the mind on to attend closely so if we follow to know and then i did word study on know to have understanding of to have experience of to be aware of the truth or fact of to recognize the nature of to be convinced or certain of so if we are going to keep our mind on knowing God, uh, to attend closely to getting to know him and understanding him, um, we should be doing that. His going forth is prepared as the morning, which means his... Uh, the appearance of God is assured just as daybreak. If we follow to seek to know him, he will appear to us. He shall come unto us as rain, as the latter. So the whole verse, I do um, kind of write about the entire verse in this because I have recently got two new translations of the old testament which is the hebrew bible one in the new korean tanakh and then also the jps which stands for jewish something scriptures i think um basically these are two jewish translations so jews have translated the tanakh or the old testament and so these are their translations and i thought that was just really interesting to me and so i put those in so verse three uh in the new korean tanakh korean tanakh let us know let us strive and eagerly seek knowledge of the lord for as dawn breaks he will come to us as the rain as the final winter rains that replenish the earth the other translation, let us pursue obedience to the Lord, and we shall become obedient. His appearance is as sure as daybreak, and he will come to us like rain, like lather rain that refreshes the earth. So I really thought that was interesting. And so he shall come to us to the latter rain 
as the rain, the latter, and the former. So based on the Mediterranean climate of the Middle East, Israel receives rain twice a year. The winter rain softens the ground for sowing, and then the spring rain provides life-giving water for what they are going to be growing. Um, so I thought that was really interesting, and I just really thought it was interesting how um, these two translations translated these. Um so the former and the latter rain is seems to be talking um, about the winter and the spring rain. So the winter rain, those rains are always, they're going to be there, right? And then I also made this note for verse 3. Knowledge is an issue, knowledge is an issue with Israel. If you look in verse, chapter 4, verse 1. That is why they are destroyed. Yet if they truly, with their heart, seek God, he will meet them. So if you follow to know, he will, you know, show his appearance and he will be present. He will reveal himself to you. Now, verses 1 through 3, I do want to talk about. So these verses can be seen as a continuation of what God is saying in chapter 5. And it can also be Hosea's own heart response to the revelation he is receiving. It can also be taken as a future remnant who will return to God and truly repent. So, unfortunately, you know, sometimes chapters are not divided well. <laughs> um, although we keep the chapters and verses to make it easier for us to find things, sometimes the chapters break up things that don't necessarily need to be broken up. So these verses can be seen as God continuing to say this, but it can also be seen as Hosea saying these things. If we follow, because it says, if we follow, let us return. Um, so it could be different, different ones and different things. Um, I'm kind of leaning toward maybe Hosea saying it, but again, it is difficult with prophetic books. Now, Verse 1, I do have an application for this. God will, at times, punish or chastise us for our own sins here on earth. You can reference Hebrews 12.6, Revelation 3.19. This helps us to remember the seriousness of sin and its consequence. When we repent and turn from our sin, we should consider what changes need to be made in our lives. So, we need to return to the Lord is what they were saying. And I think... Um, sometimes we have to do that too. Verse 4. O Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? O Judah, what shall I do unto thee? For your goodness is as a morning cloud, and as the early dew, it goeth away. So, I did a word study on goodness, and then I also interpreted verse 4 on this sticky note. Goodness can also be translated as mercy, kindness, loving kindness, merciful, the NLT, NRSV, CSB, ESV, and the NIV translate goodness as love. And then the Korean Tanakh and the JPS translation does say goodness as well as the KJV. Um, for your goodness is as the morning cloud. Um, so Israel and Judah do not know what true goodness is because they don't know God. Therefore, their effort to not have to go through their consequences of their sin isn't enough because it's not true repentance and wanting to follow God. Like fog or dew, goodness soon fades because it's not with faith and repentance. So I think there's a verse in Jeremiah where it says your good deeds are like filthy rags unto God without faith and repentance our good deeds or or us obeying God means and does nothing it has to be with true repentance and faith in God that is very important verse 5 therefore I have Hewed them down by the prophets, I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and thy judgments are as the light that goeth forth. Hewed is to cut down into pieces. Um, so this is the actually kind of the point of prophets is to correct people, um, individuals, and also nation, as this is. And. Thy judgments are as light that goeth forth. God's judgment on Israel are just 
and they are certain as light goeth forth. So the judgments are coming. And just like the sun rises and just because light is always there, it's going to happen. Um, that's basically what um, he's saying there. Now, verse 6. Now, verse 6 is a doozy. <laughs> and I'll show you why. For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. So, I wanted to do a word study on mercy. Turns out, this word mercy and this goodness in verse 4 is the same Hebrew word. So I'm like, okay, so this word can be translated as goodness and mercy, which is interesting because if you take it, for I desire goodness and not sacrifice. So it, it, just, is, it, it just sounds so weird um, to me. Um, so we did a whole little, I did a whole, <laughs> a whole little thing here um, for this. Because it was such an important verse. Like, this is, like, a main verse. Like, we see this verse even in um, the New Testament. So, I wanted to really dig a little deeper into this verse. So, I, I just used this whole... This is, like, cardstock, and I just taped it in. And um, so, so, we're looking at a few different translations. So, the KJV and the NIV translate this the same... For I desire mercy, desire and mercy are the same, and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. The Tanakh, the Korean Tanakh, says, For it is goodness I yearn for, not sacrifice, awareness of God rather, rather than burnt offerings. The JPS translation, For I desire goodness, not sacrifice, obedience to God rather than burnt offerings. The ESV, I desire steadfast love, um, and then it does have a translation note uh, that it sh sh steadfast love in the Septuagint is mercy, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and not sacrifice in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. And this is also how the NSRV is translated, the same as the ESV. The CSB, for I desire faithful love and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God rather than burnt offering. NLT, I want you to show love, not offering sacrifices. I want you to know me more than I want um, burnt offerings. NET, the Net Bible, for I delight in faithfulness, not simple sacrifice. I delight in acknowledging God, not simple in whole burnt offerings. So I did a word study on these kind of differences um, of the translation and the main points like desire, mercy, and knowledge of God. And you can kind of see me underlining them each. So desire um, is one. It was translated as delight, please, desire, will, pleasure, favor, and others. To express a wish, ask, to have or feel desire. A usually formal request or petition for some action. So God is petitioning us and telling us what his desire is. What he wants. And then mercy. Kind of, so we kind of did it up here, but I went ahead and did it down here as well to just have everything together. So mercy is compassion of forbearance. Forbearance. A blessing that is an act of divine favor or compassion, compassionate treatment of those in distress. So, it makes sense if we define mercy as that, compassion, treatment of those in distress. As sometimes it is d translated as goodness, faithful love. In all the new translations, ESV, NLT, NET, it's all translated as kind of like love. I do like the NET, how it translates as faithfulness. I do like that translation. Okay, sacrifice. So, not sacrifices, right? So, all of them says sacrifice. But a sacrifice is an act of offering something precious, destruction, or surrender of something for the sake of something else. Loss. To suffer loss or give up, renounce, or destroy. So, Basically, you're surrendering something for something else. Um, 
knowledge. So the knowledge of God, awareness of God, obedience to God. So there's a few different translations. But this word in the King James um, comes from the word know, translated as knowledge, know, cunning. The fact or condition of knowing something with familiarity gained through experience or association. So Jesus actually quotes this verse in Matthew 9, 13, and 12, 7. Reiterating the internal principle, God wants you, your heart, and your love. Rituals are meaningless without true love and repentance. Love gives action, meaning, and value. I spent a lot of time on that verse, <laughs> just so we know. <laughs> okay. But they, like men, have transgressed the covenant. They have, there they have dwelt treacherously, uh, against me and i have a note somewhere where did i put the note because i have these brackets which means i did some cross references oh here they are um leviticus 26 deuteronomy 28 through 32 um is the covenant that they're speaking of it gives blessings and cursings and things like that it really talks about the covenant um the old testament covenant in there Verse 8, Gilead is a city of them that work iniquity and is polluted with blood. And as troops of robbers wait for a man, so the company of priests murder in the way of consent. I did a verse 30 on the consent, which was interesting um, because it is actually a, I cannot say it, S K E K S. H E K E M is a place in Palestine. It's a city located in a valley between two mountains north of Jerusalem. And so, because we're talking about Gilead and things like that, um, so I was a little confused. Um, about why the KJV does consent when all the other ones use the actual thing. Because it talks about Gilead and talks about Skakim. I don't know if I said that right. For they commit lewdness. I have seen a horrible thing in the house of Israel. There is whoredom of Ephra Ephraim. Israel is um, defiled. So I did not like. Oh, I did mark it. I just can't see it. There. These two verses are marked in this kind of pale mint color. Um, so th these verses are talking about polluted with blood. The city is polluted with blood. The priest's murder. Um, the event chronicled here may be the Pekah rebellion against the Israelites in 2 Kings 15. Apparently the fish fighting began at Adam, which is a city... Um, with the aid of a group of Gileads and spread west along um, the road into Israel as far as the city of, can't say that word. Apparently, the supporters were aided by the priests um, from Bethel in their efforts to eliminate the king's obstacles. So, so that was really interesting. Verse 10, I have seen a horrible thing. Oh, I already read that. Um, Israel nation, Israel is a national God was the Lord, but they committed whoredom by going after other gods and idols, a horrible thing that defiles them all, breaking the covenant with God. So he's horrible thing. This is not like a light thing to God. This is a horrible thing. Verse 11. Also, O Judah, he has set a harvest for thee when I return the captivity of my people. Judah, though less corrupt than the northern kingdom, was still guilty of breaking God's covenant as well, and so not to allow them to become proud as they saw the northern kingdom's destruction, God gave a warning their harvest of judgment will be eventually be reaped. Um, so they will be judged as well. So that's pretty much what that is about. So I hope you are inspired and encouraged to dig deeper into God's word and have fun with it. Like it doesn't have to look like mine. Um, you don't have to put as many notes as I do. Just have fun. Grow closer to God. That's what I really want you uh, to get from these. And, you know, 
learn something new about God and Jesus and how the Old Testament works and things like that. It's always fun to study the Old Testament to me because it's, we're so, in the West, we're so, it's such a different culture and things like that. We're so far from it, you know, over thousands and thousands of years from this happening and things. And so it's just fun. So anyway, remember God loves you and he's always with you and I'll see you in the next one. God bless.